All right, let's uh, let's get started with a word of prayer. Sorry about the late start here. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for um, communicating to us, Lord, your heart, revealing to us uh, the essence of who you are, and um, sharing with us uh, words of hope, words of encouragement, um, purpose, and meaning. We pray, Lord, tonight as we walk through this time together, you would just continue to deepen our appreciation of your word um, and our resolve to live according to it. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this time. We just commit it to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to be tonight, uh, looking at one of the parables. Uh, when we talk about parables and understanding parables, what are some rules um, that you might think of as we come to parables, things to keep in mind so that we might understand parables the way they were meant? Glenn, give me one. Parables are essentially an earthly principle to teach a spiritual truth. Okay. An earthly story, illustration, as it were, to try and communicate to us uh, some spiritual truths or some more complex truths. Um, than uh, uh, than we might know otherwise. Good. Okay. Other thoughts? Jesus mostly spoke in parables. Okay. Jesus, the majority, a lot of his teaching were, was in parables. Can you think of, uh, there's probably two distinct reasons why he taught in parables. Can you think of two examples, not examples as far as uh, here's one, but uh, two different types of reasons why he spoke in par parables? Okay, so there's three reasons. Didn't think about that one, but good. It's to fulfill Scripture. Scripture says that he would speak in parables. Good. The other was almost like a, uh, the triumphal entry where they were so hardened in their heart, and he just said, that's it. From now on, they get nothing but parables, isn't it? Wasn't okay, yeah. There was, a, there was a point where he wouldn't explain the parables to the people he was teaching, other that he would explain it to disciples later. Right. Uh, because they've turned and hardened their hearts, they're not open to the truth in the first place. So he wasn't going to continue to pursue that. Uh, there is evidence that um, when God's truth is presented directly to people who are resistant or rebelling against it, uh, that that truth uh, ends up being the very catalyst that hardens their heart in the first place. Um, so it's interesting that there are times when Christ specifically told either the apostles or people that he healed uh, not to go and tell other people about it, and it may very well be that he was preserving those particular people that would have been told from getting their hearts hardened in the first place because of the spiritual state or the lack of receptiveness uh, state that they were in, if you want to call it that. Um, this is an interesting. Uh, this isn't. This is an interesting um, parable, and it comes in a, in the midst of a series of parables. Let me give you some background. Um, I, I asked these three questions in the very beginning. Have you ever felt destitute, alone, or oppressed? Wondering if it will ever change? Are you in need of hope? This brief parable is found at the beginning of a short series of parables in the Gospel of Luke. They're a conclusion to, much, to a much longer set, starting in chapter 14, after Christ's authority is challenged when he healed on the Sabbath day. Remember that? He heals on the Sabbath. Pharisees come, they challenge him, you know, say that you're working on the Sabbath, why is that right? Uh, so it comes after, or on the heels of that. Uh, this set of parables is interrupted by a time of Christ teaching the disciples. They ask Jesus to increase their faith just back in verse 5 of chapter 17. Luke then illustrates how Christ demonstrated the value of faith, even for a foreigner who went beyond mere obedience to proper response of giving God uh, giving glory to God in 17, 11 through 19. So he heals a number of people in verses 11 through 19. Uh, they go away, and on their way, they get healed. One of them returns and gives glory back to God. And, of course, the narrative is, uh, uh, where's everybody else? Weren't, weren't, weren't there more of you? And, and uh, so he goes the extra mile to come back and give God the glory there. So we have that in the context. Uh, there Christ ends the exchange with a statement about the power of faith. Um, in verse 19 there. After the shorter section of the large set of parables, Luke again relates Christ's healing of Bartimaeus at the end, ending with confirmation about the power of faith 
causing praise to God as a natural response. It is clear this entire set of parables is placed here for the benefit of the disciples' plea when they ask Jesus Christ back in verse 5 of chapter 7, increase our faith. And the Lord began to teach uh, at that point, and Christ understood purpose of it, and that was that their faith would be increased, but for a distinct purpose. That is for the glory of God. Um, and ultimately, we see that unfolding throughout this whole kind of discourse of parables that are going on here. The, the topical progression of these parables from chapter 14 to the end of chapter 18 will add depth to the meaning of the parable itself. Uh, so we want to come to the, the parable with that idea. What kind of everyday things in life make you feel destitute, alone, or, or oppressed? What kind of everyday things in life make you feel destitute, alone, or, or I can't say, or oppressed quickly? <laughs> it's the O's, I guess. Okay. You know, no, nobody's talking to you. People are just basically ignoring you and you feel so alone. Isn't that interesting? You can be in a big crowd of people and feel very much alone. In fact, that's one of the drawbacks of our social media culture that we live in today. You are, in a sense, in the midst of billions of people that are online, and yet you're alone. You, you can talk back and forth a little bit every now and then, but for the most part, while you're surfing, while you're looking, while you're posting things, unless they're directly answering you, you're alone, even in the midst of all those. So that's one way. What are some other everyday things that cause you to feel oppressed, um, alone, or destitute? When you have to figure something out, you have a problem and you've got to figure it out and there's nobody around that you can ask and figure out. Okay. I do this all the time with the computer, you know. How yeah. do I, it just makes me feel so alone because I don't know, you know, why is it doing this instead of this? <laughs> Kind of how I felt five minutes ago when I was trying to connect to this TV behind me. And I just, I, I should have known that I have to do that ahead of time so I can make sure that they're all connected. So uh, anyways, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, when you're, when you feel like there's no one else there to help you and right. you, this is your responsibility, you got to do it. Right. Myself and even Mary after dad's death and then having to walk through all the phases of a full remodel. She said, what well, never handled that there was stuff before. You know what I mean? Yeah. She was really, really feeling isolated, and uh, yeah, she's she's actually just switched churches, uh, mm. which was she said it just everything reminded her of her dad, and pastor said something about divorced people serving, and she mm. was like, ah, I'm yeah, that was the icing on the cake. So yeah, there, there are things that can isolate you. Sure, you sure. What about oppressed? Are there everyday things that make you feel oppressed, that's oppressive to you? Feeling? The news. <laughs> oh, the new, that's depressive. That's depressive. <laughs> All right, I tell you what, sometimes, sometimes I try and record the news just so I can go fast forward to the weather because that's really, that's almost all I care about. But, well, yeah, the we it's different there. It's, I like hearing the talking about it and stuff, but anyways. Uh, so oppressed, what? Yeah, yeah, but what about oppression? Are there everyday things that make us feel oppressed? No. Yeah, I think uh, like the way Christianity is being oppressed. I mean, okay. Everything in the world is acceptable now, except for Christianity. Yep. Yeah. Every religion, every belief system, correct. Everything is 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 acceptable, and in fact, um, forced to be acceptable, um, except for Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think. Things uh, oppress, uh, makes me feel oppressive. Rules and regulations like permits for things that you can't get or should be able to get. Common sense, th sense things like that. Um, sometimes when you're dealing with a contractor, of course, you know, this is all my background now, but dealing with a contractor and they're supposed to be doing certain things and then it ends up being falling back on you and you have to carry the load for different things. Uh, taxes, right? That can be oppressive. You're forced to do it. Inspecting the cars, you have to get it done. I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things in life that could probably make you feel um, oppressed, maybe in a general sense, uh, a little bit. What about destitute? Paying my taxes. Yeah, 
That's actually after you've paid your taxes, right? <laughs> I am now destitute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all of those things. Yeah. Do you think over? Do you think overcoming these moments um, means never feeling that way again, or is overcoming something different? Okay, so in some ways, the expectation to never feel it is probably not realistic. No. We're going to feel it. We're going to feel alone. There are times we're going to feel oppressed. There are times that we're going to feel destitute um, and desperate. Yeah, right? Perilous times will come, Second Timothy says. Or is it First Timothy? Anyways, one of those. Here I go again, right? Um, List and discuss for me, or just in your head list, but discuss for me, the progression of topics of these parables from chapter 14 to chapter 18. Most of your Bibles have little headings above the parables and things like that. Can you give me, there's a general category of the, of the parables, um, 14, 15, 16. Uh, there's kind of a general category that you can label those parables with. And then... Um, and then afterwards, the parables um, from chapter 18 to the end of chapter 18 there. Are, can you give me some ideas of maybe some, some ways that we could categorize those? Maybe topically or... First two are about uh, dinner guests. Okay. So what's the idea there with the dinner guests, the lost sheep, um, what's the lost coin, the prodigal son? What, what do those parables have in common? Glenn? They start with a main group of people and narrow down to an individual in most cases. Okay, so they start more general, narrow down to specifics. What else would those parables have in common? What's the idea? Yeah, every one of them is talking about going out and restoring back, finding the one that was lost and bringing it home, finding the, the possession that was lost and being able to reclaim it, right? It's all about bringing back that which was lost. All of these. Good. What about chapter 18? Now we have uh, the parable we have uh, that we're going to look at today is, is, is the, the widow and, and the judge. We got the Pharisees and the publican. Um, Pharisees, right, they're, they're, they're looking at themselves. I mean, look at verse 9 of, uh, of chapter 18. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in what? themselves. So now we got a section talking about themselves. The rich young ruler, what was his problem? Possessions, Possessions right? All focused, um, all focused on what? Those two things. On the earth, right? What, um, myself, the answers that this life has to provide for me, right? So that's kind of the flow of what we're looking at here. Major themes, how they relate to each other. In the beginning, those, the, the earlier ones, it's, it's all about how do we claim things back, right? The disciples have asked, Lord, um, increase our faith. And then he begins to talk about all of these things uh, leading up to that that were lost, right? Leading up to that. And then they say, uh, build my, increase our faith. And then coming out of this little section of teaching that he does here in the, in the very middle, he then teaches about the fact that the world themselves, even though this is the answer he gives them of how to build their faith, the world itself doesn't have the answer. The rich man didn't have it. The Pharisees and publicans didn't have it. The only answer is God himself. And that's what we're going to come to. So let's look at verse 1 of, of chapter 18 um, and just um, talk about some thoughts here. Um, verse 1, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Now we know the parable is going to talk about a story. It's going to give a picture. It's going to take us away and, and give us this, this idea of um, maybe moral precepts and values. But if we've come to a parable that actually explains its purpose, then that purpose that has been stated is the focus for that parable. You might have other side issues, other topics, other characters that we're going to look at in a minute that all carry meaning with them. But it's all focused on that stated purpose. Notice verse 1 says, here's why he gives a parable. Verse 9, here's why he gives a parable. 
Verse 18, a ruler question. This is why he gives a parable. So whenever you find that in a parable, you have to note that that's going to be the main theme of that parable. There may be other themes, and we're going to look at that, usually with two or three or four characters, each one having their own sub-theme, but that's going to be the main theme. What is the stated purpose in verse 1 Christ gives for this parable? Okay, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and to not lose heart. How does that fit with their request to Christ to increase their faith? What can we assume, maybe, about them? Trials are a spiritual exercise. Yeah. Can we assume that they're heavy-hearted at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lord in Christ, increase our faith. I mean, this is right before the triumphal entry, all right? They've already gone through, um, you know, the challenging the Pharisees and the Sadducees when he healed on the Sabbath and all those things. It's flowing out of that. We're coming up on the triumphal entry. Um, uh, uh, we have all these other parables. And, and, and now they say, you know, in, in the midst of all of this, um, he's talking about stumbling blocks beginning at 17, and then they say, Lord, Lord, they're just feeling overwhelmed. Can you increase our faith? Help us to trust what you're telling us more. Help us to understand or have a greater confidence in what it is you're teaching us here. And then, and then we come down to this passage, and, and he says, now, let me tell you a parable, disciples, specifically to disciples here. And imagine this is coming out of the flow. What, what's in the verses immediately at the end of verse chapter 17? What's that all about? We kind of looked at it a couple Sundays ago. That's all the second coming, right? So he just shared with them about judgment to come. The, the judge of all of creation, right? And the end times, the kingdom is coming. It's kind of a restatement in a different way for the sake of the disciples of Daniel chapter 9, right? It's all right there. And now, in the wake of that, he says, Now, so that um, they might understand how they ought to pray, and how they ought not to lose heart. Let me tell you a story. So he sets the table for disciples, and he says, look, I'm going to, let me tell you a story here. Let's look at, um, oh, what might the disciples, we, I just, I kind of did four, five, and six all together there. Um, what, what can we assume about the disciples' emotional state? They're probably pretty distraught at this point. Confused, concerned, overwhelmed. Uh, maybe feeling a little bit oppressed. Um, Christ is, is about uh, telling them that he's getting ready to leave, right? Because he talked about, uh, in chapter 16, he talked about the fact that, um, that he's going to send another, or John chapter 16, he's going to send another comforter. So he's already starting to prepare them that he's leaving, all of those things. Uh, their world is turning upside down. Uh, let's look at verse 2. Uh, verse 2 um, he started this story by saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. What's the difference between fear and respect, do you think? Um, he didn't care what God says or what people say. Okay, so you kind of look at it as synonymous a little bit. Okay. Other thoughts? Fearing God is to have that reverential view of him to acknowledge who he is. And, you know, it's not that we're afraid of him, but there's a certain you know, view that we should have of God, whereas man is not the same as God, so we should not have the same attitude towards man that we do towards God. Yeah, it's almost like he's saying, I really don't care about anybody else. And I, and I certainly don't dread God. It's like he doesn't even, it's almost like he doesn't believe in God. So there's no dread, there's no concern about God, and he doesn't care about others, um, if you, if you kind of want to put it there. Um, that, that, that at least seems a little bit like the two things uh, that we can learn about this judge. He doesn't care about people, and he's not afraid of God. He, he doesn't have any dread or wholesome perspective of the reality of who God is or, or what uh, God cares about. Um, verse 3, there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, 
give me legal protection from my appointment. Uh, my, uh, my, I'm sorry, um, opponent. I'm, yeah, adversary, opponent, it's probably a better word. Um, my oppressor, if you want to call it that. What can we learn um, or culturally assume about this widow from this verse? What can we learn from this verse and what might me, we be able to culturally assume, knowing a little bit about what we do about Bible times? Okay? She didn't have any sons. There's nobody to protect her. And she's a widow. She doesn't have a husband. Probably has no money. Probably has no money. She's probably destitute. Why would she have no sons? Um, because she would be looking to her sons for protection. Okay. I would think. Yeah. Yep. Or the sons would be going to find protection. It wouldn't be her. Because it, it wasn't typically, if a woman had a man in the home, it wasn't her place to go to the judge. It wasn't her place to go to the bima. It wasn't her place to to pursue those kind of things on behalf of a man in the house. Yep. Other thoughts? What else can we learn about her? She's a widow. She has respect for the law. She has respect for the law. She has some kind of a legal problem here. Yeah, legal problem that makes her feel how? What? Oppressed. Oppressed, right? Help me, keep me from my oppressor. What was the word that your translation had there, Paul? Adversary. Adversary. Somebody who's standing against her. She's certainly at this point feeling oppressed. She's feeling alone. She's feeling in need of protection. Uh, she's a widow. She's probably childless or at least sonless, uh, whether or not she's without any children. Um, all of those things are true. She's Pastor Eddie? at a point where it's like she has not, no other, nowhere else to turn. You know, it's like, and she can't, maybe she can't ignore it anymore. It's just too much. Yeah. She has to turn to the only source that she has to, for protection. Yep. Nowhere else to turn at this point. She doesn't know where else to look, so she goes to the judge. She didn't give up either. She kept going to him. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, and, and, and that's interesting. I had a great observation, Paul. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him. The idea of that, of, of that phrase is that she just kept going and going and going and going. She was very persistent, uh, at least in the story. I know this is not a true narrative, but in the story, uh, we can identify that that's what he's trying to communicate with that. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. For a while, he, being the, the, the uncaring ruler, the un, unrighteous ruler, for a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God, I, I, I really don't have any dread of God, I, I'm not worried about who he is or what rule he has or sovereignty he has over me. Um, nor do I respect man. I, I don't care about this woman, at least in the story. Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it wears me out, or, or, or I collapse because of it, or I get destroyed because of it. Yep. Um, and verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the righteous judge said. Now, what does your translation say there? The unjust judge said. Yeah. Right, right, I'm sorry. What does your translation say there besides unjust? Unrighteous. Unrighteous? Hear what the unrighteous judge, unjust judge said said. All right. that What's that? I said you cracked out a term. This is an antithetical to the real God. Yep. We'll get there. These verses end with an imperative command there in verse 6. What did the Lord want the disciples to understand about what the unrighteous judge said? Because he says at the very end there, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, usually I hear that kind of phrase before it's explained, right? I hear, listen, I want you to listen to what I'm, about, what I'm about to say to you. But instead, Christ tells the story about what the judge says, and at the end he says, now, hear it. What do you think he's trying to say with that imperative, that command? Okay, there's probably a, a part that wants them to think about it, process it, understand what he's saying? Springboarding off of uh, the 
17.5, increase our faith, this is the spot where your faith is going to be increased. Yeah, one of the ways, one of the keys that you can take note of when you want to interpret parables is when there is a almost a surprise, uh, what would we call it? Um, uh, yeah, um, you know, like in, a, in an election, there's, there's the October surprise. It's like the thing that all of a sudden appears out of nowhere and kind of stops the, the, the rhythm, stops the throw of things, the flow of things. We almost get that feeling here, don't we? All of a sudden, he tells, he, he snaps out of the story and he addresses the disciples directly and he says, now listen, think about, meditate on what did this judge actually say? What did he say? You tell me. What, what, were the, what, did, what did those words mean? He's going to grant her what she needs. Okay. Right at face value, he's given in. All right? I'll grant it. What's his motivation? To get her off the back. Get her off yeah. back. Yeah. Just get off my back, will you? Just, just stop already. Oh, they wear you down. Oh, yeah, they do. Yep. And that's what he's worried about, right? At least in a story. All right, I'm going to grant it. And, and what, is it, what, how, what does it reinforce about his attitude? Still reluctant. St- still doesn't care about God. He still doesn't care about me. He right. just wants to relieve. He only cares about himself. That's all that matters to him. Uh, we've all known people like that, unfortunately, um, or been affected by people like that. Or, he says, or were one. Yeah. <laughs> He says, listen, disciples. And, and think of this in terms of a Jew now, all right? What was part of, of the nation of Israel's problem in their relationship with God? I, and I'm not talking a specific moment, but other than idolatry, I, I know idolatry was the big one, but what is, what's their real issue when it comes to the law? Legalism. Yeah. Outward obedience without anything inward. What a picture we see here of that, right? He says, disciples, pay attention to this guy. He did what was right on the outside. And he even even made it right and just for that woman. But look at his heart. What's going on in his heart? There's a problem there. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. Now, still speaking to the disciples, he's not in the parable now, he's, he's teaching. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? Now, let's just stop there for a minute. He says, for, first off, disciples, he, hear what that guy did. Now, what's the comparison he's making here? Selfish, worldly judge that has no regard for for God or man, comparing him to God, who does have a, a an invested, caring interest in the person. How much more? It's arguing from the lesser to the greater. Yeah, it's a parallelism here, isn't it? Yeah. Here's two parallel figures. There's one that is an unrighteous human judge, and one that is a completely righteous deity judge the God of creation. Let me show you the difference. Think about his heart, the the, the earthly judge, and the actions that he did. Now let's look at God. Will God not bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? It's, It's put in the form of a question, but it's assumptive. You know the answer to it, right? Don't you think God won't bring about justice for his elect that cry out to him? He's saying, look, in the midst of all of these things, you're asking for increased faith. We're going through all of these things. You've been through a lot. You're going to be going through a lot more. He, he understands that. He talks to them about the end times. He teaches them all of those things as well. And then he goes into this parable explaining, um, explaining to them this and wanting them to understand in the midst of this that God is paying attention And he's not like this earthly judge. There is no 
wrong motives in his heart for what you're experiencing, disciples. No matter what you're going through, no matter what fears you have, no matter what, how you perceive the lack of faith that, that, that you sense within you, and, and whatever is causing that, and whatever is going to cause that in the future, please know that God's sovereignty involved in that does not flow out of any kind of unrighteous motives. And what he does on the outside will exact justice. Ultimately, it will. He even talks about timing of that. Look at the end of that verse. Um, he says, Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry for him day and night? And will he delay long over them? What, what New Testament verse does this remind you of? Second Peter three three nineteen right three nine three nine right the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men consider slackness but is long suffering toward us uh, not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance is God really delaying wrongfully if his motives in his heart are right absolutely not he can't right again the parallelism between him. And this other judge. I tell you, verse 8, that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, one of the Son of Man, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The nature described of the response from God. What, what is the nature described of the response from God as judge? What's the nature of God? described in that. What question are we on, Pastor? Number 11. What is the nature described of the response from God as the judge? The nature describes um, uh, involved, caring God. Okay. Involved, caring. Can you think of a, what's that? Patient. Patient just right he is just that is one of the attributes of god that demands his reaction to sin and his drive for redemption right he's a just god he demands justice and he will exact justice and we see it there uh, absolutely clearly in his response there what do you think verse 8 Look at the question at the end of verse 8. What do you think verse 8 might be referencing with that question? When he comes, and he is going to come, by the way. He's going to come quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? What do you think he's suggesting with that question? There's going to be a lot of ungodly people doing ungodly things. Okay. At the end. There will be a lot we have the benefit of foresight because at this point when the son of man comes we second know coming the whole is there that everyone that has faith is with the lord in the air before the second coming so there's nobody going to be on earth mm -hmm. with any faith well, and that's will. the purpose yeah, of the tribulation yeah, I mean, we just went through looking at what the second coming is going to be like when Christ returns and he's going to set up his kingdom. Is he going to find people on earth of faith? Yeah, well, I think so. when, he, when he initially touches down, I say no because everybody's raptured out. The no. only people heading into the... Morning. He's not going to touch down until the end of the tribulation. End of the tribulation. Right, right. So okay. That's the... That's the second coming. You got the whole You've tribulation. You've got the rapture okay. for the, the millennial. Yeah. You go through the uh, the tribulation. I'm sorry, uh, before the tribulation. So are you, you're trying to say that there's no one that gets saved during the tribulation I'm period? I'm not saying that. I'm okay. saying when his foot touches the earth, and he at the end of the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, which is the start of the millennial kingdom, at that split second. Anybody with faith, uh, maybe there are tribulation saints coming out of there. Yeah, there will be saints. Not most tribulation saints, many will be martyred. Yeah. But not all. In addition to the fact that there's 144,000 of Israel yeah. that God has preserved that are saved because he's chosen them. 
So there will be... But now you're dealing with the elect and he's saying one earth. Um, are you, are, is there any kind of separation? I don't understand what you're trying to differentiate there. So Christ, <laughs> end of tribulation, Christ returns. Right. He says, at that second coming, at the end of the tribulation, when I'm coming to set up the kingdom, is there going to be a judgment then between righteous and unrighteous? I think, I think there's going to be people who realize, hey, they told us they were going to be raptured. They are. They are. We better start believing. But it can't be done in the flesh. Uh, no. Because at that point, or up to that point, the Holy Spirit is not removed, but restrained. Right? Because people can get saved during the tribulation, come out like you were teaching. So, His ministry has changed. Okay. The indwelling ministry, because the church is raptured. And that indwelling ministry is for the church specific. Right. The church is raptured out, so his ministry changes. It doesn't mean his presence is gone. Um, but it, when it talks about the restrainer being removed, removed from the ministry he was involved in, not removed physically, um, there are going to be people who come to know Christ as Savior during the tribulation period for sure. When Christ returns, there is going to be an a, judge, a judgment then. That's the sheep and goat, right? That's the sorting out. His question is assumptive. It's not a question. He's not questioning the disciples seeking an answer. When I come... You tell me, is there going to be? He's assuming they already know based on what he just taught them. Not, not, not only here, I mean, we only have Luke's account in Luke here. But if we put all the accounts together and what they've been taught, e even in, in the book of Daniel and throughout the Old Testament, in the, in the Minor Prophets as well, they already know that there will be people of faith when Christ returns because there's going to be a sorting out of the righteous and unrighteous. So he's being assumptive here. He's saying, look, even when we talk about getting to the end, won't God preserve the faithful? Aren't they going to be there? They're not going to be erased by what's going on in this life. That's the point he's making to them. It's not really a, a, an apocalyptic type of statement here. He's just referencing in the story. Disciples, listen. Think about this. You're, you're, you're worried because your faith is waning. You want me to strengthen your faith. You know, here, here let me reassure you, the, second, the, 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 the end is coming, second, second coming in 17. Let me tell you about this woman and the unjust judge. And look at it, it wasn't just, but listen, you can trust God. In the midst of all this, you can trust God because he is the judge. And his motives are pure. And they're not in any way unrighteous. And he is going to come. And when he comes, we know that there will be just those that are just on this earth, those who are faithful. And they certainly will be here. That's the idea of that question. Listen, when the Son of Man comes, won't he find faith here on earth? Of course he will. That's the point that he's making um, there with that. Ultimately, why is he telling them this? What was the reason he was telling them this in verse 1? So that they might know what? That they ought to pray and don't lose heart. Listen, here's how you increase your faith. Pray and keep heart. And, and what, what helps them to keep heart? What's the story about? A righteous judge, right? Who exacts justice and won't delay more than he should. And will come and find his faithful. He will. I think he's trying to say that there will be people here. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Take heart. There are going to be some people here. This world and this life will not erase faith in this earth. On this earth. In him. Is what I mean. Yeah. Go ahead, Glenn. This might be way outside of the box. But since I was thinking through that wrongfully. Were the patriarchs or just any of the Old Testament people able to come to faith outside of the ministry of the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Tell me. I, I mean, I do know, but let's think about that. What is the Holy Spirit's job when he comes? John 16, verses what, 8 through 11? Right? When he comes, he will convict the world of what? Their sin. So in order and righteousness, right? 
in order for someone to come to saving knowledge of God, and that's Hebrews 11 of the Old Testament saints, right. what does it take for them to appreciate the reality of God's Word or their position with God? It takes the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Interesting, we don't think in terms of those. The specific ministry of the Holy Spirit for the Church of Jesus Christ is the, is the automatic indwelling ministry and the giving of special gifts for the church. But that's limiting him just to the church when he actively had a role in the Old Testament. No, it doesn't, it doesn't limit him to it. It expands it. His role has not changed. It's just been added to for the church. Yep. David also claims that um, his his writing of one of the psalms, I can't remember which one it was off the top of my head now, um, the writing of that psalm is through the work of the Holy Spirit itself. So it's the Old Testament equivalent of Second Peter chapter three and verse or, or chapter chapter one verses nineteen through twenty. Twenty one. Influenced by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Holy Spirit is still at work. The Holy Spirit didn't have an automatic indwelling sealing ministry with the believers. But he certainly convicted them of their sin and drew them to God. Because they're saved by grace through faith like everybody else. Just Hebrews 11 tells us that. It is by faith. That's the only way to come to God is by faith. And we can only come to God by faith out of total depravity if God does something to stir our hearts in the first place. So good question. All right. Uh, how might this parable fit with the topic then of, of the end times? We talked about that. How do you think this parable helps the disciples not lose heart or have their faith increased? How do you think that happens then? Yeah, what kind of things, what kind of things are they facing with Christ? Oh, just that, I mean, think of being outcast when Christ ran the pigs into the ocean and they kicked him and the disciples out. I mean, we always look at the momentum building up against Christ with the Pharisees, but that exact same negative momentum was taking apart with all of them. Yeah. They were becoming equally as unpopular with everybody he was ticked that the Lord, our Lord, was ticking off. They were almost looked upon as negatively as the Samaritans at this point. They were a cult. Right? Because that's why Saul rises up against them. Yeah, this is not something that was mildly dis uncomfortable for them. This was significant persecution that they were going to be, that they had already experienced and were going to be experiencing even more. Uh, absolutely. And when we look at this, uh, the disciples facing that, he's, yeah, that's what he's saying to them is, look, have heart. Here's, here's how your faith increases. When you go through those things and still see the judge of verses 7 and 8, when you still see him, you still know that he is just. You still know that his, that his motive is in place. You still know that he will come. And you still know that when he comes, the faithful will survive to the end. The more that you see that, the more you'll understand and the greater your faith will become. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. In context of bringing the lost back home, the stewardship uh, demand of life, and the promise that the end will come as promised, don't lose heart. God will bring about justice when it is the right time. In the meantime, don't trust in yourself or the things that this world has to offer. That's the Pharisees and the rich young ruler, right? Don't put trust in yourself or the things that this world has to offer. Rather, recognize that through it all, as you pray, your faith in God's respect and justice will increase. Unlike the judge who had no respect for anyone. Isn't that interesting? The contrast, the other side of that coin is, God does. You ever thought in terms of the fact that God has a respect for you? He has a regard for us. 
He's concerned for us. He cares. Well, yeah, even that, even more so. But I mean, humanity in general. It's his creation. Unlike this judge, in contrast, he didn't care about anybody but himself. God certainly does care for us. Um, and he does that. Um, as you pray, um, your faith in God's respect and justice will increase, and it will see you through for his glory. George Bernard Shaw is perhaps most renowned as a free thinker and liberal philosopher. In his last writings, we read this, and this is his quote, The science to which I pinned my faith is bankrupt. Its counsels, which should have established the millennium, led instead directly to the suicide of Europe. I believed them once. In their name I helped to destroy the faith of millions of worshipers in the temples of a thousand creeds. And now they look at me and witness the great tragedy of an atheist who has lost his faith. Wow. You don't think of an atheist as having faith, do you? Oh, yeah. They've got faith in the wrong thing. Isn't that that's one of the most incredible quotes really from an incredible person? What do you put your faith in? The wisdom in things of this world or in the unmovable resolve of your Creator God? He says, that's what will build your faith. Keep heart. Continue in prayer. And God will see you through to the end, no matter what the situation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this passage. Your desire, Lord, to use everyday circumstances and situations in this such a story, this parable, to communicate to us, Lord, truths that might otherwise be difficult for us to grasp. Lord, I thank you for your desire just to share of yourself through your word to demonstrate, Lord, um, your concern, your respect for humanity, not in the sense of our significance, but in the sense of the significance of your love. Thank you, Lord, for being one who sent rescue and who will yet rescue. Give us strength and ever-growing faith as we remain in prayer through this life, looking forward to your glorious appearing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.